Welcome to another episode of Victoria's Lounge from the Radisson Blue Hotel. Today on the show, we have motivational speaker and life coach, Michael Flynn. I am telling you, he has one inspiring story. Even Hollywood would be envious. So, are you ready? Well, let's meet him and my audience and let's get this conversation started. Michael Flynn is a mentor, educator, leader, author, entrepreneur, father, philanthropist, master persuader, sales trainer, and musician who has traveled to over 22 countries addressing and advising various leading businesses and CEOs globally. He has an extraordinary story that you have to hear. All right, I'm really excited about this particular conversation because we've gotten so much reaction from uh, our viewers asking, can you do something a bit more about self-worth? And clearly it shows that there's a need uh, in our Kenyan society when people want to know who am I, why am I here? And a lot of it has to deal with purpose. Um, so Michael, thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure. Thank you. Great but to we be want here. to kind of get a better sense of who you are, you know, and, and what brought you here to Kenya. You're Australian. I am. I am. Yeah. I, I grew so up take in us Sydney, a bit Australia. Of your background. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, thanks. For, thanks. Great to share that. I grew up in Sydney, Australia. My, my uh, parents were immigrants from the UK, from the Northern England uh, poverty, uh, uh, coal miners, and with very limited expectations about their future. So they went to Australia looking for a better life, mm. and uh, moved to a, a, what, what at the time and, and possibly still is was a very tough area called Bankstown. So I had the pleasure of going to school with thugs and, and, and saw a lot of violence and uh, kids from dysfunctional homes. Uh, my father was a, <clears throat> an alcoholic womanizer who was hardly ever home. Uh, my mum uh, had survived uh, a most dreadful sexual abuse background in, in her life and enacted quite a bit of that abuse on me. And, uh, and things were pretty bumpy inside my head. Uh, Basically, I, I learned from school, I learned to, to either run or be funny or fight. Yeah. And it was more like a prison scene. I mean, I, I had a very brutal encounter with a kid when I was 15, simply because if you didn't step up and have some sort of, like, you'd become the, the, the kid who got picked on. Right. It was very tough. So it was all about survival. But it was also about who have I got to be yeah. to survive this? And a lot of us in our childhood go through those sort of encounters. We all have a story. We all have a background. We all came from something. And many of us learned to, to disconnect, as I did, from who I really was because it was about how do I survive this? Right. Who, who, do I, who have I got to be? So I became good at sport and, I, mm. and took on a whole lot of personality traits that were more about surviving and not actually about who I was. Right. I, I wanted to sh share a, a very important thing that we were talking about out, out there uh, earlier on, which is about the soundtrack of, of our life. Because between the ages of zero and seven, we've got no filtering mechanism whatsoever, the psychologists tell us, against what's coming in. So we just suck up and what mum believes, I believe, and what mum does, I do, and what dad does, I do. And there's an awful lot, the Jesuits actually have a saying, give me the child at seven and I'll give you the adult. Because so much of, of what we think and our attitudes are, are drilled in at that age. Yeah. So uh, as a result of my dysfunction, I accidentally ended up going to university. My parents had given me a soundtrack that said, basically, you're not going to amount to much. We're the Flynns and you're a nobody. Mm. I hate the fact that you want to play guitar. This was the, 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 yeah. the, the background. I hate what you want to do. If you really, really try really hard, you might. So I wanted to be a lawyer and I did not even apply for law school <laughs> because I just did not believe that I could ever be anybody. So I took a teacher's scholarship because my family was poor because that's what I thought I had to do. Within one year at university, as I shared with you outside, somebody gave me a joint of marijuana. It took them a couple of hours to talk me into trying it, and I did. And I was a train wreck emotionally inside waiting for an accident to happen, and I was in trouble with drugs. So I became one of Sydney's biggest drug dealers within two years. So I got to where the guns and the violent guys <laughs> want to play. Mm. And... Ooh, and I don't actually know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. So I end up uh, 
having some major experiences, and I'm going to look you in the eye and tell you the only reason I didn't get to prison or dead was God. I'm so curious because you've described uh, a movie-like experience, yeah, you yeah, know, um, yeah. a rough childhood coming yeah. up. How did you start to make the turn and unlearn a lot of the things that became a part of you? Like you said, these are things that you kind of see and you take on based on your background and experiences. I really, really like what you've just said in the question. And actually, there's the answer right there. You, you, you need to unlearn. You know, your, your, your past doesn't equal your future. Because I, I was uh, angry in the car park yesterday, that doesn't mean I'm an angry man in the car park every day. <laughs> right. Because yeah. I threw a ball and scored a goal, that doesn't mean I'm a perfect person who every time I do that, I get it right. Life is a journey. Life, in every single moment, we have the capacity to take a look and say, well, this is who I am right now. We're defined by three things. What we focus on right now, what our brain focuses us on right now is going to affect our body. Oh, I'm focused on a whole lot of things I haven't got. I don't think I'm any good. I don't think I'm going to get anywhere. I haven't got rent. I haven't got this. I'm no good at this. And as soon as we start to focus on what I do have, like being grateful in the morning for my two daughters, I think about that every single day. Yeah. A gratitude. Three things that you're grateful for every single day will change your life. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've all met somebody out there who says, Oh, I'm not that sort of person. Mm. And then the question is, when did you define yourself? When did you put yourself in a box and say, well, that's it. I'm this person because of my past. Right. And I think the other answer is the passion to be more. <coughs> I didn't want to be the, the abuse victim all my mm. life. I wanted to be somebody. And at 25, with a pair of, after laying in my mother's house for six months, impacted by drug abuse mm -hmm. and intravenous use that had given me severe hepatitis. Wow. So the down things are really the best gift you ever have. Those are the moments of, the desperate moments of maybe what's gonna define you. Right. Maybe that's the point, right. maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. And I sat there and said, I've really got to turn my life around. So m maybe for a start, let's get a job, like something. Mm. And I went to a, a, a uh, I, I love music. I've always played music. So, so I, I went to a music store and I, I basically sort of sold myself and begged the guy for the job. And, and he said, look, you're just so incredibly passionate. All right, you get the job, yeah, you know. Yeah. Okay, kid, you got the job. <laughs> and I met a mentor. We all need mentors. Yeah. That man changed Very my good. life. Yeah. He gave me a set of motivational tape and says, here, I see something in you. Listen to this stuff. And for the first time, I had a positive soundtrack. Wow. And I just, and the, the the fuel of negativity obsession and the drug obsession turned into an obsession to become more. Hmm. So I started being a salesperson. That within three months, I was the best salesperson in that company, $12 million sales music company. Within one year, I was the best salesperson in Australia. Wow. Obsession, just sheer, and, and I was bad when I started. So within one year, I'm wearing a $1,000 suit. I've gone to, a, yeah, I'm wearing it, you know, and guess what? Girls want to go out with me now. <laughs> but I got the gift of a gab. I got this sort of smoothie. And I was so bad. I remember being reported to my manager for being a bad salesperson. And you're so rude and you're so pushy. And that's what you do. You find the line of, of, of where you're, you, that's a little too, and you find it by going there and just being prepared to fail. Like fall over a few times, guys. It's really exciting. And you keep trying and one day you're good. Being willing to explore, but also being ready to make mistakes, Absolutely. especially from someone who you've made so many over your lifetime and you're thinking, I can't afford to make another mistake, otherwise I'll be deemed a failure. <coughs> but how can oh. someone who's kind of, kind of gone through that past and background still embrace making mistakes and being okay with it? Oh, gosh. My only regret at, at, at sort of 62 in a few months, years of age, is that I didn't make more mistakes sooner. <laughs> Wow. I mean, get in, rip in. Because every decision you make, and making decisions is going to define your life, every decision you make is the right one. And here's the reason why. Because if it's the wrong one, you'll find out quicker. Mm. And if it's the right one, your, your life's going to accelerate. 
So whichever way you go, make decisions and rip into it. Great. We need to take a break on this. I just, I can't even stop the conversation because there's so much inspiration and, you know, nuggets that you're dropping. But, of course, we'll be engaging our audience after this break. Stay with us. We'll be talking about self-worth. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. We're talking about self-worth. Goodness, part one of the show. I felt like we could have just ended it there and just <laughs> gone home. There's so much. I mean, and that's the beauty of hearing someone else's personal experiences, mm. their struggles, mm. is we can learn, you know, uh, from what they went through and avoid some of the pitfalls. Uh. Um, but let's talk now on the subject of self-worth. It's an area that a lot of people struggle with, I think, through their lifetimes, you know, and we never necessarily get it right. Uh, but I've been hearing a lot of people, especially crossing into 2018, I think maybe it's that whole New Year's resolution thing of self-care. You need to start taking care of yourself. And a lot of it comes from people feeling maybe I worked too hard or gave too much of myself in a relationship that I didn't focus in on me. So how does someone develop self-love, self-acceptance without crossing into the territory of being self-absorbed? Yeah, great. So how do you kind of strike that balance? Self-absorbed comes from thinking that what you think of me matters. Mm. Whereas self-worth comes from what I think of me matters. And if we can learn to love ourselves and nurture yeah. ourselves in a positive way, if we can learn to give to ourselves in, in, and listen to the child inside and its real needs, then maybe we can take that out and offer it to someone. And how that works in a relationship, for example, let's say you and I get into a relationship. What? I think you should make me happy. What a hmm. dreadful expectation to put on you. That's just, and what, my job is to make you happy? All the happiness there is in the world comes from the desire to make other people happy. And just, just taking a look, I know what it feels like, because later I fell over in life again, which we'll probably get to talking about. I know what it feels like to sit on a waterfront apartment overlooking one of Sydney's most expensive, beautiful bays. And, you know, and I'm in the front row, and I've got a beer in my hand, and I've kicked another goal and raised a couple of million dollars, and I felt bad. Hmm. Is this it? Yeah. Because the self-esteem was coming from the outside, not the inside. But as soon as I start to focus on you, how could I be helpful to you? Something shifts mm -hmm. and great businesses can come out of that too. That's a very powerful place wow. to be. And you know what? You can't stop me wanting to give to the world. And that's a very powerful place to start your entrepreneurial movement from. Mm -hmm. Want to be a millionaire? Help a million people. Want to be a billionaire? Help a billion people. Mm -hmm. And drive into, into that is Wow. It's what I would get. And, and I love that you mentioned the whole thing of, is it about the give or the get? Because yeah. a lot of people derive their self-worth from what they have, what they I, can get. It's about the chase, you know. Yeah. And we're consumed by that. Let's take Richard Branson as an example, because yeah. he's the first one. Oh, and Nelson Mandela. Let's talk about the, the, the two heroes of mine. So let me see what we're saying. So when Richard Branson was uh, selling secondhand records, having been thrown out of school as a dyslectic, he was a loser, is, is that right? But now he has a billion dollars, he's a winner. <laughs> no, the same guy that grew from there to there is the journey of success, and that was about his belief right. that he could be more. Nelson Mandela spent 26 years in a prison and set us all free. How do you do that? <laughs> How do you come out of that and not be bitter? Wow, amazing. I want to open up to the audience for questions sure. or comments. You've really told us about what you went through, the challenges that you passed through. Maybe at what level, because now you recovered, what level did you reach and you realized that you've gained back yourself or you've, you're accepting yourself? Because there are most people who go through challenges, they're not able to reach at a point and they're not able to evaluate themselves and say, okay, I'm here and I guess I've done it. I'm acquiring, I'm, 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 I'm coming back to my real self. At what level? I never do. There are two things that are certain in life. One is that we will die. And the other is that everything will change. 
People think that the biggest challenge in their life is that they want to change. No, they don't. Change is inevitable. That you, 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 you. Our bodies are changing. Mm. Our, our suits are fraying. Uh, the building is eroding. Uh, the climate is changing. The economy is changing. The political environment, the, the business world, the opportunities, everything changes. We are inevitably beings of change. Growth is not certain. Personal growth, now that's a decision and that's a choice. And it's not a place that I arrive. So to answer your question, my job on every single day for me, for you, is to be the very best I can be. So when do I know I'm getting there? Feel it. When I'm thinking about what I can do for other people and gaining the power to do that, that's when I feel empowered. But the minute we think we've arrived, we've shut off the mm. tap. We've said, oh, I got, you know, here comes the ego. Oh, oh, oh no, no, oh, I'm at that level now. Hey, stay a child all your life. Keep growing, keep learning. Now, I've heard your story. I'd, I'd like to know how, I've, I've heard about how God has changed your life. Mm. Can you share with us a bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. What I didn't tell you was that when I sat, recovering from hepatitis for six months, my family was quite poor and there was only one book in the house. <laughs> what do you think it was? Bible. I read the New Testament every single day and developed a relationship. And you know, I'm not in any way qualified to talk about God. And as long as I remember that all my life and remain teachable, and allow myself to, 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 to be fulfilled on that spiritual journey, maybe I, it's what I don't know that can keep me healthy. M maybe, maybe, maybe that's where I can learn to grow. In the journey of um, self-care and in the self of knowing yourself, there will always be this case where people are involved. There is you and then there are the people who you're with. And in most cases, you find that um, the journey gets harder because you're worried about people. What are good people going to say? What, how are they going to take it? Because we have the environment, we have the people that we stay with. You find that there is a struggle that you're having and the people that are around you. And at some point, you need to um, get them out of the way because you need to get into where you would want to be. How do you keep the focus and make sure that in the journey and as you continue that you don't stumble along the way first of all your past doesn't equal your future that's a very important thing to to embrace they're not connected if your past is your future then that's what you are now is all you're going to be and that's just not true i mean i mean you're so much more than what wherever you no matter what you've achieved already your future can be a whole lot bigger first thing secondly it's a it's a truth of life Show me the five people that you and I spend the most time with, and that's who you are. We are the five people that we spend most time with, okay? So those are our choices. Listen to the soundtrack of your daily life. Be honest about it. Is this a positive soundtrack? Is my, are my friends tell me, where are you going to get the money from for that? How are you going to do that? I live in the real world. Am I hearing these negative voices, these critical voices? You know? Or am I hearing something like, say, you know, you go, girl. You've got that, I can see the fire in your eyes. You know, I'm really proud of you. You know, you're really stepping up and, and doing that exercise and you're really growing. So those are our choices as to, to what, we, what we actually surround ourselves with. And it's so important to surround ourselves with five people who will tell us the truth. Mm. Mike, you're too much right now. <laughs> okay. Mike, that's not where your integrity needs to be. Like, you can do better. Okay. Mike. Here's some good ideas for you. And to be teachable, you know, drop the defense. The minute I defend, I shut myself off from the learning. Mm. Maybe it's true. It's true. Yeah. But then if it's a negative, you know, select your friends very wisely. Be around people who take you there. Mm. And that is especially true of our intimate relationships. If, this, if you're in an intimate relationship with someone who's putting you down, get out of it. Yeah. Just, just move on. You're better than that. When you think you're better than that, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. Can we talk about something? Because she talked about, um, okay, people around you kind of trying to kill the dream or whatever it mm. is you want to go after. Mm. Um, 
Then there's another aspect of you not even needing help <laughs> to bring yourself down. It comes from within, <laughs> you know, um, and I, I like to call it the victim mentality. Yeah. Where you can blame everyone else for this is why I'm where I'm at or my circumstances or my background and not take full responsibility for you, for your actions. Um, to now, and, and still on that track of finding your self-worth, how does someone take full responsibility and move away from that whole victim mentality of it's the fault of the people around me or the circumstances that I'm in? We don't have to fall into the, the victim mode. We have voices, we'll talk about this a, a little today, I hope so. We have voices in our head. I'm responsible for what I listen to. So you know what? Hands up if you've got one of those voices in your head every now and again that goes, you're never gonna be any good. Come on, what, only one, per two people? Come on, oh, it's here, hands yeah. up if you have a critic. <laughs> I'm not gonna, you don't. I'm not gonna <laughs> get that, you really don't. I'm not, come on, hands up if you have a critic in there. Ah, these shoes we are not going to work. This is, I'm not going to get that girl. I'm not going to get... Who do you think you are trying to be an yeah. entrepreneur? You don't know what you're doing. Look at where you came from. You're a kid from Bankstown, man. Mm. Who do you think you are? Hey, I can get into that. Now, could we play a silly little game? For 10 seconds, think about your most negative moment. Think about when you're really in your stuff. You ready? 10 seconds. Go there. Watch their faces. Go there. Actually... Go into your negative, come on, go there. When you really, really, really are unleashing that negative stuff in your head, you can see the faces change, right? Oh, yeah. Thanks, guys. Now I'd like you to turn to the person on your right and say that to them. Go ahead, unleash on him <laughs> and her. Tell her. Go on. Go on. Unleash on her. Tell her what you think. And they don't want to do it. They don't. No one's brave enough to do that. No one's going to do that. You know why? Because you're not going to talk to somebody else the way you talk to you. Right. And why do you talk to you like that? Wow. And you, what we as human beings have a choice to do is start to challenge it. Are you never going to be any good? Excuse me, what evidence do I have for that? Hmm. But I kicked a goal in soccer. That was pretty good. No one loves you. Hang on. My mum loved me. My dog loves me. Maybe I need to do something more loving. Maybe I'll go and volunteer in an orphanage today mm. and give some kids who really don't have love some love. Maybe if I start to give what I want to get, my life will transform. Wow. What a telling illustration. And we need to take a break on that and we'll talk more about the voices you're talking about, Michael, in our heads and where they, they will eventually lead us uh, in life. We'll take a short break here on Victoria's Lounge. Stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. You're watching Victoria's Lounge. Uh, so before we get into the whole exercise on the voices in our heads, uh, people may be thinking, well, my schizophrenic voices in my <laughs> head. Um, I need to ask this because a lot of times we can, it goes back to the whole thing of what people say to us and how we allow them to speak into our lives. Um, someone very important to you, very close to you, who just, for the life of them, is so negative. Everything that comes out of their mouths to you, about you, is just negative. How do you confront that? Because you still need them, um, especially if they're a very intricate person in your life. You don't want to just discard them and do away with them. You said, you know, if someone's negative, just walk away. But sometimes you need that person in your life. How do you confront them in such a way that um, it doesn't push them away, but they understand where you're coming from and would now kind of tailor a lot of their critique to build you up as opposed to break you down? Sometimes we're not going to fix it. Sometimes we're not going to have the moment where the person says, hey, I'm sorry, mm. or I, I get what I did. Maybe what we need to do is change ourselves and not live in the victim mode of, un and, and once we make it conditional, oh, if you don't apologize, I'm not okay. Right. That's where I had to go. Hang on, I need to not need this. Mm. Because that's a form of self-abuse. Maybe we need to work through the fact that that person's capacity is there, that I also need to find not aggressive, assertive ways to say, okay, here's my limit to what I can take here before I'm becoming negative or angry myself. Right. Right. Hey, you didn't have to say that. So th there might be an assertive way to, to just keep my own power in mm -hmm. this situation, but also maybe limit the time sometimes. It's like, you know what? 
I'm not sure I want to spend the whole day there because I had experiences in my time where I would spend too much time around that person mm -hmm. and feel really wound up and angry and act out right. as a result of it. Right. And, and, and so, you know, that there's a boundary. It's about being able to set up personal boundaries, which we all need to do. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and by the way, it's my responsibility to do that and it's your responsibility to do that. Right. You mentioned something really important, especially when it comes to someone as close as a parent, for instance, mm. who you'd never get the apology from. Yeah or the sorry from that you feel you need to move on. Yeah. What does someone do in that space? Because again, uh, yeah, it will come down to you. You can choose to move on even if they never apologize. Absolutely. How do you do that? How do you find the healing when the person never acknowledges where they were wrong? You, you, you stop expecting it. Now, now, and and there's, there's no one answer to that. There are many books yeah. about these subjects. You, you, you know, maybe you need to educate yourself. Maybe you need to go and have some, some therapy sessions with somebody. There's nothing wrong with reaching out for help. You know what I've learned at 62? Let me share this with you young, beautiful people. This is a wee deal. Try to think of the world with only you in it. Have anyone seen that Will Smith movie, The Legend? Try to think of waking up in the world and there's only you in it. Try to think of a world with only you in it, like seven billion yous. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oi. It's a we deal. Yeah. At the end of the day, your interests are my interests. Maybe I need to go get a little help if I'm really out of my depth with it. Mm. Maybe I need to sit quietly. I got into meditation and I've got to tell you that that also gave me a very powerful tool just mm. to watch. People sometimes think meditation is about not thinking. No, it's not. It's about watching yourself think. And then you can start to see, hang on, why do I think like you, you can observe the ego at work and the mind at work? There's a lot of freedom in, in that place. The most beautiful thing is to try, to grow, to explore. Why do I feel this way? Why do I feel that way? Quiet time. Find the tools to do it. They're out there. They're in the books. They're in the seminars. They're in the therapy sessions. Yeah, yeah. Talk to a friend who you know has been there also. All right, wow. So look for the resources. Look to the Bible as well, because you can find a lot Absolutely. of the answers there. A uh, couple of questions. You know. Yes, go ahead. You've talked about setting personal boundaries. So on that, how do you draw the line between making yourself a priority and not being selfish? I would suggest that my role and your role, Susan, is to be the very best you can be and where you then aim that at. You know, my purpose is, is to share 40 years journey from literally the gutter of my negative self-worth, my negative thinking. I've been so down. I've been so up against the wall. I ended up with drug, alcohol, all sorts of stuff, right? I know for a fact that I'm also the same guy that was in boardrooms putting business plans and raising $2 million. I'm, I'm the guy who worked with Colgate and Home Olive. I'm, I'm the guy that travelled the world. I could never have imagined that was possible. And, and you can do it. You absolutely can, can take the journey. As soon as you, you, you start to define yourself by what you do on a daily basis, it's the journey. And it's so exciting. And you can. You absolutely can start. Right now, if you want to, you can just pick up and go, what are my dreams? And we don't write them down because we're scared and we go, oh, and the critic comes in and says, oh, no, I can't do this, I can't. Yes, you can. You can you, you, you're not meant to survive. You're meant to thrive. You're the creator of your life. You've done it before. There's something you did that's so outstanding, you, you, you know how to do it. You need tools. Get them. So once you've started this journey, uh, how do you ensure that you don't come off as being arrogant once you've been able to sort of self-discover yourself? Uh, initially, we talked about also being uh, old school. Uh, so my concern is that, say, the millennials have grown up in a better environment than uh, our parents. So you end up being assertive, which then the older generation does not know how to deal with that. So then it, uh, uh, how, how can society reconcile those two uh, concerns between the millennials, uh, millennials uh, uh, view of self-worth self and the older generation? It's the oldest story in history's pages. It's been played out with every generation since time began. We can't ever imagine our parents doing the sort of things that we did. We can't imagine them wanting to break away from home. And, and, and guess what? We're all the same. 
nothing ever changes about that. What people think of you is of very little consequence. So if I call you a bad person, does that mean you're a bad person? No. If I call you a car, does that mean you're a car? Oh, oh Eric's a car, guys, because I called him a car. So freedom comes from the power to follow your dreams and be an example. And I'm, I'm, I'm very close friends with a, with a great poet here in Kenya called Mufasa, and his parents are wondering when he's going to get a real job. <laughs> and, and the fact is, he's an immensely gifted, talented person who really has something to, to share with us. And, and so do you. You've got something to share with us. Go for it. Great. So I think this is a perfect segue into finding out what this is about. We want to make this session also very practical mm. uh, for the viewers so you have something that you can use uh, and implement. So what is this all about, Michael? Here is a tool for you guys to take home and, it's, and I'm going to give you a challenge. I'm going to give all, all the listeners, the viewers and, and the audience here a challenge. Right? These are the voices that drive human beings. They're inside you, they're inside me. This is, was given to me when I was around about 40 years of age and don't take my word for it. 30 day challenge, can you identify these voices going in inside you? Here's an example of, of how it works, a male example. So I'm walking along the beach one morning, I'm, I'm you know, by the beach side and I'm going to work, it's Sydney, Australia, and I see a really pretty girl and my head says, Wow, wouldn't it be really cool if we just sort of bounce over there and get to know her and, you know, maybe... And the critic comes in and says, Are you serious, man? You need to get a life, man. Maybe we could get arrested too. Like, that's <laughs> not a good... You're such an idiot, man. We're supposed to go to work and that's how you want to talk to me. <laughs> Fortunately, we have a functioning adult inside us that says, Perfectly okay to get attracted. No problem. Now let's go to work. You have the negative voices of your soundtrack. We, all t we talked about it a little earlier. It's going to usually be people from your childhood who talk like that. It's Uncle Bob. It's Mum who was full of fear. It's Dad who said you need to be an accountant because that's where the security is. The critic says, you're not good enough. What makes you think you can do that? You grew up in the shags. Oh, come on, girl, you can't seriously think. This voice is there, there's nothing you can do about it. The child, the child is where your entrepreneur lives. The child comes up with this incredible concept for a new TV show. Your child says, what if I could do, wouldn't it be just amazing if I could actually go and sing in the church group and, and like really explore my singing? What if I could go and get that job? What if I could actually take a course and what do we do? We spend our life ping-ponging between trying to crush the child. But if you look at every great entrepreneur, there's a childlike quality in that invention, that's something that they gave us. As soon as you, so your 30 day challenge is, can you notice the voices in your head? Can you actually start to clock them? And as soon as you do, you have self-awareness. You can begin to say, wait a minute, thanks for sharing critic, no need to put me down, that's a perfectly good idea. And you know what? I'm excited about it. And if you can, in your moments of decision, do something about it, like start, start now, start now, start now. Actually pick up the phone, make the call, book the course. <gasps> this is exciting. I can't believe I booked it. I'm doing it. Yeah. Your life will change. You can change it in a heartbeat. That's your 30-day challenge. Who's up for it? I definitely am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope our viewers are as well. Thank you so much, Michael. Such an uplifting story. Thank you so much to our audience. I hope you are inspired by his story of overcoming insurmountable odds to inspire others. I hope you were encouraged by his story. Now, we've partnered with Bata for this particular episode, keeping with the theme of self-worth. They have a campaign running that is dubbed Me and Comfortable With It. Take a look at this.
All right, so here we are at the Butter Store, right next to Kencom, and we're talking men's shoes. Mwenesi Musali is here with me. How would you describe your personal style? I mean, generally when I see you, very clean-cut guys, suits and everything, but right. how would you describe your personal style? So it would be sort of your classic man, sartorial, urban, corporate, uh, with a little bit of edge, um, okay. anywhere where we can, you know, accentuate uh, and, and, and accessorize. But right. it's more classic and, and, and suited and booted. Okay. For instance, now a business meeting, right? Uh -huh. What would be the ideal shoe or something that a guy can go for to impress? The trend is to keep it um, simple, okay. where you would go for something like a, a brogue. So okay. broguing is where you have the, the, the detailing on the shoe, something like this. Right. It's, it's clean, it's, it's classic, and it, uh, it, it makes a statement without being too over the top. Brown, black, Don't, let's, not, let's not play too much with it. If you are feeling a little bit more adventurous, you can actually wear a boot. So now when it comes to a more kind of chill kind of feel, mm -hmm. uh, but more for the guy who's on a budget and he's at work, but he can't also get a second shoe for the weekend. How does he balance the two with the same shoe? Um, so invest in a good quality shoe, something with, with nice, decent leather. The workman's boot is something that is completely versatile. You can actually wear a workman's boot with a suit. Some guys can actually pull it off. Um, you can wear it with a pair of jeans, you can wear it with a pair of khakis, you can wear it literally anywhere. Okay. All right, so now it's a weekend, you're hanging with family, the boys maybe. Right. What is the go-to shoe? You can't go wrong with a loafer. Okay. You know, it's nice, it's, it's relaxed. You want as, as, as minimal interference on, on the bottom, so no heel, just something uh, with, a, with, a, with a decent strong rubber sole. Um, or uh, a, a, a nice stylish uh, tennis shoe, something, something like this. What shoes are you looking at here? So if you are if you're running, then you want something that has both an arched heel okay. and an arc. You see something like this, which has you know the the arch on the back and the arch at the front. Mm. As you're running, that it gives you that yeah, that's that, support. that that support in that system. But the other thing about running is a breathable upper. If mm. you're if you're doing anything that requires cross training, cross training needs. If you look at the the, the top of the shoes, it's breathable. Yes. If you are into like weight weightlifting and training and that kind of thing, something with a sturdy upper and and good support at the bottom, a very strong thick rubber sole, something along these lines would uh, would do the trick. So what is your parting shot in terms of what someone should consider when going shoe shopping? Um, your own individual style is very important because you have to feel comfortable. There's no need getting something that you don't you know, feel represents the kind of style that you have. And your image, your perception of who you are is very important to the outside world. Right. Um, comfort is also yeah. super, super important. I mean, if you look good, you feel good. Right. And, and, and that comes out in, in how you address people. Oh wow, I wouldn't have said it better myself. Thank you so much, Mwenesi. And for the guys watching, we have a special treat for you. Two 5,000 shilling vouchers from Bata. And we want to ask you, what describes your most authentic shoe style? Tag us on Twitter and on Facebook, the Victoria's Lounge social media pages, using the hashtag comfortable with it. And you might be a lucky winner with one of those vouchers here at Bata. All right, so I hope you are keen and you will be sending us your photos of your most authentic shoe style and you might be walking away with one of those vouchers. Thanks for watching. Thank you to Radisson Blue Hotel for hosting us. Have a wonderful evening and let's do this again next week.